Hello, my name is Daniel. I'm a park ranger here at Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historical Park. Today, I'm out in the elm lot. The native grasses here create a great habitat for all kinds of animals, including insects, mammals, and birds. Right now, I'm looking for a special bird called the bobolink. Let's go see if we can find one. Bobolinks spend all of their time in open grassy fields. They're about seven inches in length, roughly the size of a large sparrow. The male is very distinctive in the summer. They have this black underside and face with white plumage along the wings and the back and a yellow nape. Their song is a bubbling, cheerful warble of short notes of different pitches. Some people say it reminds them of R2-D2 from Star Wars. Female bobolinks are brown with dark brown streaks, but also have a yellowish tint overall. If we were here in the elm lot in the winter, we wouldn't see any bobolinks. That time of year, they're living in South America. But each spring, they migrate across the globe, returning here to the northern part of the United States and southern Canada to raise their young. Bobolinks rely on grassy fields to nest each year. They build their nests on the ground among the grasses and catch insects in the field to feed to their young. Unfortunately, modern agricultural practices often interrupt the bobolink's nesting process. When hay fields are cut too early, they can destroy the bobolink nest before the young have learned how to fly. Here at the National Park, we monitor our bobolinks to make sure that we don't let our partners cut these fields too early. Other organizations are working towards the exact same goals. The Bobolink Project works closely with farmers to make sure that they don't cut their fields early. We have two friends from the Bobolink Project here today, and while maintaining our six feet of social distance to make sure everyone is safe from COVID-19, we're going to talk with them about what they do for the project. My name is Alan Strong. I'm a professor in the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources at the University of Vermont. I uh, use he, him, his pronouns. My specialty really is avian ecology, but a lot of the research that I focus on is grassland birds. And so in 2013, uh, I was approached by an agricultural economist named Stephen Swallow, who was at the University of Connecticut. And we submitted a grant to try to see if we could actually use bobolinks or grassland bird habitat as essentially an ecosystem service to see if we would get people to actually pledge money to conserve this habitat. That's great. And why did you also like bobolinks? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, bobolink populations are declining. We've seen their populations decline something like uh, about 75% in the last 50 years. So they're definitely a species of conservation concern, but they're also really a charismatic species. And we often think about charismatic species. We think about bears or mountain lions or something like that, but people get excited about bobolinks. I mean, they're really showy, they're flashy, they fly around in circles and sing this amazingly, you know, sort of bright, vibrant, happy song. So bobolinks seem like a really good species to focus on. My name is Margaret Fowle. I use she, her pronouns, and I work for Audubon, Vermont. I'm a conservation biologist there. We are a state office of the National Audubon Society, so um, we work in a variety of projects that involve education, conservation, and policy. And my work with the Bobolink Project is to work in cooperation with Mass Audubon and UVM to um, monitor the fields that are enrolled and help them uh, keep track of how many bobolinks pledge from each of those fields each year. Once we've received a list of fields that have been enrolled in the project each season, we, Al Strong and I, um, and potentially other staff from Audubon, Vermont, go out to um, determine how many bobolinks are in those fields. So we usually go out and walk transects and count the number of birds that we see. We try to go while the birds are still 
in the breeding season, so we're not confusing uh, females and fledglings, but we're counting males and females, uh, walking transects back and forth, and then we tally up those numbers and based on kind of the average number of young that we know bobolinks produce in Vermont, we then estimate how many fledglings are produced each year. If you're a donor, there's usually a deadline for giving a donation sometime in April. And then if you're a landowner and you want to enroll your field, there's also a deadline for putting in your request for uh, to be enrolled. And those are usually around the middle of April. Um, they get set in January or so, those official deadlines. So you can go to the website, uh, bobolinkproject.com, and there are two options for donors and for landowners. And you can click on each of those options and, and follow the steps. Thank you so much to our friends, Alan and Margaret from the Bobolink Project for coming today and talking to us about these special birds. And thank you for watching our video. I hope to see you again for our next installment of the Working Woodland series.